Whenever we baptize a child here, we ask the parents or guardians to make a whole slew of promises about teaching their child the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments, bringing them to the communion table, introducing them to the community of faith. We ask them to bring their child up in the Christian faith and life, and as part of that, we also ask that they put the scriptures in their child's hands. Which all sounds lovely and sweet when you think of the passages where Jesus blesses little children and makes a big picnic on a green hillside. It sounds lovely and sweet, but then along comes a reading like that one we just heard from Mark's Gospel. And you wonder whether putting the Bible in those little hands is such a good idea after all. Or in our full-grown hands, for that matter. The Bible is a complicated, messy book. Yes, with parts of astounding beauty. Steadfast love and righteousness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other, says that psalm we read together. But there are also parts of violence and greed and intrigue and abuse of power that sound right at home alongside the stories from the daily news or movies and television shows that are always there to promise more of the same. So when we gather for worship on a Sunday, and the reading is the beheading of John the Baptist, you sort of have to ask, what is this doing in the Bible? And what is it doing here in Mark's Gospel? Mark's account of the good news of Jesus. There are lots of things that set this story apart in Mark's Gospel. To begin with, it's a break from the Gospel's usual pace. Mark tends to waste no time in getting directly from one thing to the next, often using the word immediately to keep things going. But when you get to this story, you can't help but notice a change in that. Because all of a sudden, the immediately's are gone. All of a sudden, Mark pauses the action and gives us a flashback, recounts a series of events that happened some time ago. He moves slowly and deliberately through this story, giving us lots of details about all the characters involved. It seems to show up out of nowhere. You probably didn't imagine you were coming to hear a story this grisly this morning either. And maybe most striking of all, Jesus is nowhere to be found. It's the longest section of the gospel without him. So we quickly discover that story has four main characters. John the Baptist, King Herod, Herodias, and Salome. You know who John is. This is the great prophet who started off the whole story, calling for repentance by the riverside, pointing to Jesus as the fulfillment of God's promises. Here we learn that he also took on that typical prophet job of pestering the king. Herod is the local Roman appointed ruler over the region of Galilee. And in John's eyes, he's done a very bad thing. Jewish law forbid a man from marrying his brother's wife while his brother was still around. We would call that adultery, and that's what Herod has just done in marrying Herodias. John learned of it and showed up at Herod's palace in his camel's hair tunic with rough words of judgment, which of course doesn't go over very well. Off to jail with John. And things stay this way for a time, apparently, Mark tells us. Herod is fascinated by this prophet down in his jail cell. Maybe he admires the strength of his convictions, his courage, or his freedom to say what he believes. Strange as it sounds, the king liked to go listen to John down there in his jail cell. But Herodias did not. She was embarrassed by John's critical words and probably a little baffled as to why her husband kept listening to this strange, prickly prophet they had put behind bars. She was ready for him to be silenced once and for all. And the chance comes at Herod's birthday party. This is a lavish occasion, as you can imagine. It's a banquet for the king's officers and courtiers, for the leaders of Galilee. Tables are heaped with food, wine is flowing. Everybody who was anybody was there. And the entertainment for the evening included a dance by the king's daughter, Salome, also called Herodias in this reading. The dance was good, apparently. So good that the king made a show in front of everybody of promising Salome whatever she wanted in return. Even half my kingdom, he said. That's a big offer for a young person, 
So she asked her mother's advice on how she should answer, and Herodias had gotten her chance. The guards show up in John's cell downstairs, and this time it's not to tell John that the king wants to speak with him. The party takes a chilling turn, and all the more chilling, I think, because this gift brought upstairs on a platter and handed to a young girl doesn't even seem to stop the celebration. In that room full of somebodies, this ragged prophet's death isn't even worth stopping the music for. It's just one more spectacle. The reading stops there, which to me sounds awfully close to far too many stories today, to far too many examples of suffering on the margins, ignored by those in places of power. The civil war rages on in Syria. Refugees from that present conflict now number more than four million. Even closer to home, the boats keep setting out onto the Mediterranean Sea with untold numbers arriving on European shores, or lost, arriving here maybe with a shaky future at best. John's disciples take his body and they lay it in a tomb. And the reading stops there, disturbingly quiet, disturbingly void of good news. You probably noticed we didn't sing Alleluia at the close of that today. It just doesn't feel right. But of course Mark's gospel doesn't stop there. And to get to the meaning of this story, and to get back to that question of why it's here in the first place and why we're still reading it, I think you have to pay attention to what comes before the story and what comes after it. Immediately before this grisly tale, Jesus sends his disciples out for the very first time. And immediately after it, half a verse after, they come back. They gather around Jesus and tell him all they had done and all they'd taught. David Loos, a commentator I like very much, points out just how important this is. Because when you look at it that way, when you look at Herod's horror film birthday party, sandwiched right in the middle of the work of Jesus and the disciples, something becomes very clear. There are two kingdoms here, and they couldn't be more different. On the one hand, you have Herod's kingdom, a palace, an elite guest list, a lavish meal. On the other hand, you have the kingdom of God, empty-handed disciples with nothing but words of life. On the one hand, you have Herod's kingdom, motivated by control, depending on no one. And on the other hand, you have the kingdom of God, disciples motivated by grace they have received, called to be guests, called to be dependent on others. On the one hand, you have Herod's kingdom, anxious, fearful, violent. And on the other hand, you have the kingdom of God, faithful and open and free. The kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God in this story couldn't be more different. And when you think about it, it all comes down to power. There's a scene in the old film, Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, about the life of St. Francis of Assisi, where Francis makes his way to Rome to present his rule for a new monastic order, the Franciscans, to the Pope for the Pope's official blessing. The scene is apparently based on an actual meeting between the two, and while I'm not sure anybody knows exactly what happened, the way the film shows it, Francis and his band of monks are invited to meet Pope Innocent III in an enormous and ornate sanctuary. They enter the hall barefoot, wearing the ragged robes of farmhands in their region, and during their long walk up the, up the aisle to the papal throne, the camera spends a lot of time on the clothes of the rows and rows of priests and bishops and church officials in attendance. Velvet robes of every color, elaborate fur hats, great big glistening jeweled rings, the brothers from the countryside don't look like much, with their hairy legs sticking out and dirt still under their fingernails. They don't look like much, but what's absolutely clear, as the two groups stand face to face, silently sizing one another up, what's absolutely clear is there are two kinds of power in the room. There's the power represented in that church hierarchy of the time, power that could move nations and squash opposition 
and toss this group of ragamuffins out into the street if they chose to. And there's also an unmistakable power in these brothers with their humble appearance, their eyes shimmering with light, their faces open and free with love. We don't really need the Bible to tell us that power corrupts. History tells us that. The news tells us that. What we do need the Bible to tell us, and what we need to continue to show to each other and to the world, is that in Jesus, God shows a different sort of power altogether. In Jesus, God shows a power that, in the words of Douglas John Hall, is always qualified by love. The world has plenty of people motivated by the power that comes with a bigger paycheck or a more prestigious job or greater public recognition. What the kingdom of God calls for is the power that comes from welcoming another person simply for who she is, from moving beyond division toward reconciliation, from overcoming prejudice with love, from living with open-hearted hopefulness. Sometimes it can seem like there is only one sort of kingdom in the world, only the one sort of power. Sometimes we can feel like there's really no alternative, no choice to be made. But the kingdom of God is always breaking into this world in Jesus. And it's always our choice. Where will we put our allegiance? Which kingdom will we give our life to? So the tale of John's death ends. The disciples return from their travels, they gather around Jesus, and by now it's getting dark. Everybody's tired from the journey, but soon a crowd gathers, like they always seem to. And Jesus looks at them. Their people Herod would look past. Their poor farmers and fishermen, people dirty from the fields, parents dragging sick kids behind them. Jesus looks at them. And he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He teaches them in the failing light, and he feeds them. It's nothing like Herod's banquet. There's no greed. There's no fear. There's no exclusive guest list. There's no gruesome spectacle. It's just a meal where everyone is invited, where all are welcomed, where there is room for everyone and more than enough grace to go around. It may not look like much, but it's the sort of power that the world needs. That's the kingdom breaking in, in Jesus. And friends, that's the kingdom that calls our name. Amen.